RPGs have been pretty important to me most of my life. If I was held at gunpoint and asked what my favorite game genre was, I'd probably say RPGs. Or, oh god, please don't shoot me in the head. <laughs> so when I first discovered that my favorite character in Smash 64 was from an RPG called Earthbound, I was extremely interested in somehow finding a way to play it. But unfortunately, I didn't have any consoles other than the N64, and the game costed $3 million on eBay, so this wasn't really gonna happen for me. Thankfully, when I was like 11, I figured out how to download emulators and ROMs on my, la on my dad's laptop, and I found a ROM called Earthbound and an NES emulator online. I think I remember feeling a bit puzzled as the title screen of the game popped up. Earthbound Zero, huh? What's the Zero for? I mistakenly named my characters what somebody on an image board told me their names were and I started to play. I was immediately entranced by how different this game was compared to basically every other game I had played up until that point, but I was filtered by its difficulty. This shit isn't like Paper Mario at all, what the hell? Why is this game being so mean to me? Now when I was that young, YouTube wasn't really a thing yet. Once it started getting popular through word of mouth though, I became interested in watching videos on YouTube because I discovered people could upload videos about games on there. It was a lot of fun to discover new video games that I'd never seen before by watching people play them. Oh yeah, that game that Ness is in. Let's look that up real quick. Hey, hey, what the fuck? This isn't the game that I played at all. Oh, it's a Super Nintendo game, not an NES game. Misinformation about stuff like this was a lot more common before YouTube, okay? Like, I'm an idiot, but this type of thing could have happened to anybody back then. Please stop laughing at me. So I ended up playing the real Earthbound and I loved it, of course. I could happily call it a masterpiece like every other fucking person on the planet that's played it. The original game that I tried would still linger in my thoughts though, and eventually I would return to it and give it an honest try. It's an 80s RPG, so it's got a lot of issues that keep it from being critically and culturally adored like its sequels. I tried my hardest to play it to the end, but as a kid I just couldn't get very far in it. I finished it a couple of times as an adult however, and despite its problems, I think it's an extremely interesting game that doesn't get the love or attention that it deserves, and I want to talk about it today. I'm not going to be reviewing it or critiquing it or whatever. I'm not really interested in that. I'm more interested in talking about the game as a whole and maybe expressing why I think it's nice. Before we start that though, I guess I'll provide a little context in case anybody watching this lives under a rock and doesn't know what the fuck I'm even talking about here. You've probably heard of Earthbound, in passing at least. It's a big deal. Arguably the most influential RPG ever made, this thing's presence is immense. There are countless games that have come after it that wear its influence on their sleeve, and many of those games have ended up being influential in their own right. Degrees of separation, but instead of Kevin Bacon, it's Ness Earthbound. If you ask 10 game developers in the current year about their influences, I guarantee 9 of them would list Earthbound as an inspiration. This series is really fucking important to a lot of people. I am Earthbound. I'm an RPG. The second game in a set of three. A Maybe it'll be tomorrow when the bluebird flies away. <laughs> A lot of people. <laughs> the series is known as Mother in Japan and is spearheaded by Shigesato Atoy. This guy's pretty unique and interesting as an old god at Nintendo because he's not like a lot of these other dorks. He didn't have any background in programming or coding or anything. He didn't even know how to use a computer during the development of Mother or Earthbound. He already had the status of a celebrity in Japan in the 80s as a copywriter. His main bag was writing slogans for companies and commercials and shit. Konnichiwa. Totoo detekita. Nissan Sephiro. 9月 He made this sick-ass experimental new wave album in 1980. Voice the dad and my neighbor Totoro fucking co-wrote a series of short stories with Haruki Murakami, the guy that wrote the Wind Up Bird Chronicle. He made the best iPhone app ever made, Dokonoko. You ever hear about this shit? It's an app to look at cats and dogs. My cat's on here. Itoi fucking gets around. He's an interesting man and he's always struck me as the type of person that really cares about art and creative scenes and keeps up with that shit. He's always had a penchant for western culture and when he started getting into video games in the 80s on his Famicom with games like Dragon Warrior, he wanted to make a game like that but taking place in modern America. This was a completely original idea at the time, seriously, there were no other games like this. RPGs at the time were always focused on taking place in a fantasy setting. There weren't really 
really any games set in a modern, contemporary environment. Eventually, he began a relationship with the idiots at Nintendo, and they let him have his shot at making a game as long as he agreed to write the entire script for it. I can't imagine what it was like creating games back then. The technology was so primitive by our standards now, but it's fascinating to look back on. Like, developers drawing out the sprites for the characters on graph paper before putting them into the computers they were using to program everything. The NES is really notable to me. Most of its library doesn't really do anything for me now, but it really is the starting point for modern video games. Before this console, it was just arcade cabinets and, like, bullshit Atari games. I'm not gonna say it's necessarily worth picking up an NES at a garage sale now or anything, but I think it's important to acknowledge the NES's role as essentially being modern gaming's patient zero. Mother was a huge success, by the way. It ended up being the sixth highest selling game of 1989, hitting almost half a million units sold. Serious numbers for the time. The game was successful enough for Nintendo to hire Phil Sandhop for a few months while he localized the game for a release in the West. Sandhop did a really good job with the localization. The dialogue in Mother is a lot better than most other games released on the NES, and he left in a run button that originally existed as a debug feature for the development team, just because he was a nice guy. Thank him for your ability to run. RPGs just weren't big in English-speaking countries yet, however, and they decided it wouldn't be worth the financial hit of actually manufacturing the cartridges and shipping them overseas or whatever. The Super Nintendo was also right around the corner, and they just didn't see an English release of an NES game as being worth it. Many years later, in 2015, it would see its first official release in the West on the Wii U's virtual console under the new name Earthbound Beginnings. I was excited when this happened, but I wish they stuck with the name Earthbound Zero. Earthbound Beginnings is a bit of a mouthful, and I'm not too fond of it. I've never casually referred to the game as Earthbound Beginnings in conversation with friends or anything. For this video, I'm just gonna call it Mother for simplicity's sake, but I've always known the game as Earthbound Zero because that's what the original ROM was called by the fans that leaked the original localized translation online however many years ago. This is the version that I played back then, before I had ever seen footage of Earthbound or played it, and it's the version that I played for this video now. Also, I played this shit on a retro art core that doesn't support save state, so I want you guys to know that I really played this shit the way it was meant to be played, without the comforts of modern emulation, and I still genuinely fuck with this game. I had a blast with it. Hopefully this is a fun video to watch too. Thanks for hanging out with me today. Also, this game has one of the sickest trailers I've ever seen for a video game ever. If I was a little kid living in Japan in the 80s and I saw this on my TV, it would have like changed my brain chemistry forever. Look at this shit. ま、ついに大歓声。I really like the title screen. It's simple but effective. I love the way the spinning earth looks, and I like the black a lot. I think games that use a lot of pitch black backgrounds have a very distinct atmosphere to them. I'm not Undertale's biggest fan or anything, but it's something that I really dig about it, just to name a more contemporary example of this shit. Like I said before, I was confused years ago and I assumed this game was actually Earthbound, so I wrongly named all the characters here after the characters in Earthbound, but they're actually named Ninten, Lloyd, Anna, and Teddy. I like these names because they all sound like normal names that kids would have. Nobody in the world is named Ninten. <laughs> is it fucking short for Nintendo Entertainment System? They kind of did this shit with Earthbound too. Ness is just SNES, but scrambled. But at least Ness is like an actual human being's name. In Mother 3, I'm sure Lucas translates to fucking Game Boy Advance in Lithuanian or some shit. When you start up the game, it asks you to name all of these characters. And I often do name characters silly things when I'm given the option. But for the Mother games, I usually prefer to let the characters keep their default names. The game starts off with some exposition that I guess I'll just read, actually. In the early 1900s, a dark shadow covered a small country town in rural America. At that time, a young married couple vanished mysteriously from their home. The man's name was George, and the woman's name was Maria. Two years later, as suddenly as he left, George returned. He never told anyone where he had been or what he had done, but he began an odd study all by himself. As for Maria, his wife, she never returned. Eighty years have passed since then. This is such an ominous start, and it sets the tone of the game pretty nicely. I mean, that was definitely an alien abduction, right? What the fuck did George's neighbors think when he returned years later without his wife? Like, they definitely thought that he killed her, right? Jesus Christ. So after that, we're immediately given control of Ninten. 
Ninten is our guy, but you can easily see why I would have mistaken him for Earthbound's Ness, right? They're effectively the same character. Their designs are incredibly similar, and they both serve the same function as silent inserts for the player, but there's quite a few differences between the two of them that I'll bring up when relevant. We try to leave our bedroom and our lamp starts floating around and attacks us. Oh, I hate when this shit happens. Like, imagine you get off work and come home and sit down and then your coffee table starts doing the electric slide. This whole beginning section with the house shaking and getting attacked by furniture and your little sister's baby doll is all the practice you need to figure out the battle system. Mother's battle are extremely simple and easy to understand, you know, very typical RPG shit. You got your basic attack, a few other options like using an item or running away, or using psi techniques when you level up enough to learn some of those. Again, it's a small thing and really indicative of the hardware limitations of the time, but I dig the black screens that the battles take place in a lot. It's effective. Like, look at the screen right now. Completely black, right? Now look at this. What is that in the distance there? Is it a friendly figure, or is it something that you should be afraid of? Is it getting closer or getting further away? You don't really ever know for sure, and I think this kind of uneasy feeling permeates the entirety of Mother's battles. After we defeat the possessed doll, we check it out and this melody starts to play out of it. I quite like this visual effect, it's very psychedelic for the NES. This is easily the trippiest game to come out on the system. Obviously Earthbound would up the weird visuals when it would come out years later, but for the time, this was really sick. We head downstairs and our mom is flipping out. We ostensibly explain to Nintendo's dad what's going on and he just kinda goes, huh, must be ghosts. Like he's been anticipating this type of thing happening or some shit. He tells us that our great grandfather studied Psy, which is essentially psychic techniques, and that his diary is in the basement somewhere, and that it might help us out. If we check the menu, we find that Ninten is actually capable of telepathy. In the context of the gameplay, this is purely an overworld ability that we can use to read certain NPCs' minds, but in the context of the story, I find it to be pretty interesting that he starts the game out with a psychic ability already, because it gives Ninten some motivation for getting out there and figuring out why objects are starting to get possessed and attack people. If I became a telepath and suddenly a bunch of weird shit started happening in my town, I'd want to figure out what was going on too. If we go outside and talk to Nintendo's dog, he explains that you can check things that are weird or out of place. I've heard people complain about the check mechanic before, even when talking about Earthbound, and I kind of understand it being a little annoying if you accidentally click talk when you mean to check and vice versa but it's never been something that bothers me at all. Between the conversation with the dog and Ninten's little sister earlier with the possessed doll, Mother has already shown you all you need to know about the difference between these two mechanics. I know this game can be kind of obtuse and sometimes not give you a lot of guidance, so I'm just pointing out when it actually does a good job conveying info to the player because I genuinely don't think it's the hardest game to get into, if you're willing to give it an honest chance. So we check Nintendo's dog out and we find that he's wearing the key on his collar and we go grab the diary from the basement. This first route from Nintendo's house to the first town, Podunk, is probably where you'll decide if this is the type of game you'll want to commit to or not. Nintendo has very low stats when you start the game out, and the first few non-scripted battles will test you harshly. Mother takes a lot of grinding to make any progress at all. The amount of grinding and the high random encounter rate are the main things that turn people off from this game, I think. I'm gonna risk sounding really pretentious and jerk-offy here, but I honestly don't mind this game being on the difficult side because you're playing as a kid, you feel more at risk at all times playing as Ninten and Mother than you ever do playing as Ness and Earthbound, and I find that to be very compelling if I'm being honest. I'm not gonna outright say that it's fun that this game has random encounters every two steps and a lot of random things at play that can unfairly halt your progress, but I'm gonna say that I think it makes sense if you take the way the game is designed into consideration. You have to grind a lot in Mother, and the game gives you ample opportunity to fight enemies to level up, and lots of abilities and items to make it a relatively painless experience. People complain about this game a lot, and I think it's pretty unfairly judged. The final area of the game is especially hated by a lot of people, but I didn't have that bad a time at all there. Nintendo develops a Psy ability that lets you escape battles immediately, and by the time I got there I was strong enough to handle it because of all the grinding I did. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, I'll address more things that people tend to bitch about when it comes to this game when we get to them, and I'll tell you why they're wrong and little babies. 
Podunk is the first town in the game, and it's fun to talk to different NPCs and kind of get a feel for what's going on. Like this person mentioning that a poltergeist tore through their house as well, helps sell the idea that what's happening is a big deal, affecting people everywhere. Whatever's going on is pretty serious. There's animals attacking people in the streets, dead people in cemeteries that are being reanimated and attacking the living, hippies and hillbillies are succumbing to whatever negative psychic influence is causing all of this and attacking people on site. This lady on the outskirts of Podunk is in hysterics because her daughter is missing and begs us to go tell the mayor. The mayor is insanely funny because of how big a piece of shit he is. <laughs> he just wants us to save the kid because it would make him look good for the upcoming re-election. I like when a toy sprinkles little social commentary in here like this. The keep your politics out of my games people must fucking hate this series. Look at all this SJW stuff guys. In Earthbound you can fucking fight police officers. Holy shit. It's pretty insane that we're this early in the game and we're fighting reanimated corpses and shit. They sure don't make kids games like this anymore. Pippi, the little girl, is in an underground area hiding in a coffin for some reason. Sweetie, what the fuck is wrong with you? Would you really rather be here than at home? Is your mom an alcoholic or something? What's the deal? She actually joins our party briefly and can help us attack enemies and stuff. We only have her with us for a little bit and she's incredibly weak, but it serves as a nice little glimpse into what having party members later on will be like. We take Pippi back to the mayor, safe and sound. Wow. Wow, a hundred dollars? That's it? I just fought like 35 zombies with a baseball bat. I'm fucking 12 years old. I'm gonna grow up with severe psychological damage. He immediately has a new task for us. He wants us to go see what's going on at the zoo because the animals are going insane and it's dangerous for people to go out there. Fine, I'll go fix this too. But first, let's see what Podunk has that might help us. In Mother, most cities and towns offer Nintend some provisions, like department stores to buy healing items and new equipment and weapons, a hotel that you can pay money to sleep in that will heal you and restore all of your psi points and a hospital that you can visit if Ninten or any of his party members get sick or die in battle or something. This early on in the game, I rarely seek the aid of the hotels because you can go back home to heal up and restore all of your psi points for free. But the department stores are cool. It's always nice to upgrade your weapons and do more damage in battle and... Uh... This guy's selling a canary? Fuck it, dude, sure. I'll buy it. Its eyes show sadness. Oh. Cheer up, little guy. I'm not gonna eat you or anything. There's actually an NPC in Podunk that tells us about a canary village, and if we explore around a little bit, we find a path leading out to it. There's a bunch of big bird people just hanging out over here. They're not very talkative, but if we return the baby canary to its mother, she gets so excited that she sings a melody for us, similar to the doll at the beginning of the game. So immediately, we don't really know what the deal with these melodies are, but if we check on Nintendo's status, we can see that we've collected two out of eight melodies so far. It seems like these are gonna be important later on, so I guess it's a good idea to be on the lookout for them from here on out. You know, a lot of fucking people complain about how difficult it is to find the melodies without a guide, but I don't think it's that bad. In an RPG like Mother, you tend to want to play the game by talking to everybody and exploring every house and every path and seeing everything that you can. And the game isn't that hard to figure out if you're inquisitive and take the time to snoop around everywhere. This is what a game like this is all about. This isn't Pokemon, dude. Everybody on this website that's given this game a negative review needs to write a twit longer right now. So the mayor wants us to go check out the zoo. It's to the north of the cemetery and if we take the key that the mayor's assistant gave us, but once we get up there, Diddy Kong here takes it and runs away. I recently have decided that if a game has a monkey in it, it's good. There are no bad games that have monkeys in them. Fucking this one, Donkey Kong Country, Mega Man Legends, Monkey Ball, Ape Escape. I can't think of a single bad game that has a monkey in it. Can't think of a single bad game that has a monkey in it. Not a single- The zoo is so intense. Poor Ninten is having to fight off elephants and tigers with his little baseball bat. Jesus Christ. I'm a child. Oh, cute. Look at the bunnies. Some flamingos. Okay, this area is tight, actually. We find an abandoned building, and I really dig the vines and overgrowth on the outside of it. It's a subtle thing, but it immediately indicates that this building hasn't been used by people in a very long time. Inside of the building, this eerie, high-pitched ringing is audible as we climb to the top floor. We find this Dr. Mario medicine capsule doing the Michael J. Fox, and we crack it open and fight a Starman Jr. These guys are awesome and pretty much the iconic mother enemy. There's one on the box for Earthbound. They're cool, and I've always dug the way they look a lot. Very alien, but also cartoony. I'm a sucker for character designs without faces. I think it's a nice trope. Both in making friendly characters that are extra charming and enemy characters that are extra unsettling. The animals stop being violent once the source of the high-pitched humming is destroyed, and we head back outside to see that there's a singing monkey in this enclosure. 3 out of 8 melodies already, we're on a fucking roll now. 
If you hadn't gathered already, music is a pretty important element in the series, from gathering melodies or soundstones in the games to the actual soundtrack itself being really fucking good. Mother and Earthbound share a lot of songs, although obviously the renditions in Earthbound are a bit better because the Super Nintendo featured more robust options for musicians. The level of sound complexity allowed for NES games is really limited, with only three notes being able to play simultaneously at any given time, but I think the melodies and compositions of these tunes are absolutely fantastic. There are no bad songs in this game, or even the series really. Keiichi Suzuki and Hirokazu Tanaka were in charge of the soundtrack for Mother, and they both have interesting musical histories kind of distinct from one another. Suzuki was the lead vocalist and guitarist in this experimental rock band called Moon Riders, and he also scored numerous films, including the fantastic Tokyo Godfathers. Mother and Earthbound were the only video games he ever worked on the soundtracks for, but Hirokazu Tanaka, who releases records now under the name Chip Tanaka, is a different story. This guy was already very well respected by the time Mother was in development because he did the soundtracks for the original Metroid and Kid Icarus, as well as lots of other games with very memorable and iconic soundtracks at the time. This guy still releases albums that are really fucking cool. I'll leave a link to his band camp in the description because I think his shit fucking slays. I have a lot of respect for this guy. His album Django, which he released in late 2017, is in my regular rotation. I listen to this shit while doing the dishes or making pipe bombs to mail my local congress- Ah, god damn it. It's really fucking funny to me that most of the enemies have generic names like Hippie or Snake or Bag Lady or fucking Fugitive. But this guy's just Wally. <laughs> like, Ninten is already familiar with this guy and uses the fact that he's attacking us to finally get retribution for that time we hit a baseball into his yard and he never gave it back to us. Yeah, fuck you, you old redneck bitch. That's so funny, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm getting pissed off at all these stupid adults. I'm gonna start running around. Oh shit. Cops. Okay, stay calm. Officers, I may look like a child with a weapon, but I'm actually a white woman. They actually move out of the way for us since we took care of the zoo, and one cop mentions that he heard that we're a telepath, and the other mentions that there's a weird rock in the cave up ahead. Putting these two things together, we head into the cave and attempt to use our telepathy on the rock. Oh shit, it's pink everywhere now. Weakling child? It's funny cats swimming around and little guys wearing witch hats. Alright man, I'm into this. This weird place we've been transported to is known as Magicant, and it's one of my favorite areas in the game for sure. It's such a shock after running around all this normal ass green scenery to be in this weird pink place. If we talk to some of the people hanging out here, we learn that the ruler of Magicant is someone named Queen Mary. There's shops to buy items and weapons here, and the NPCs act surprisingly ordinary considering we have no idea what this place is or why we're here. I'm strange. What, did this guy look at my internet history? Yeah, big deal. I have dreams like this all the time. This is why I stopped taking melatonin. The people living here are pretty friendly and nice. This guy lets us sleep in his house after we fix his spoon. This guy guesses my sexual orientation. You can heal here for free. There are a lot of weird enemies exclusive to this area, and I really enjoy when Mother introduces more abstract shit for you to fight and stuff. Up until now, it's been kind of off, but not too out of the ordinary besides the Starman we fought in the zoo administration building. But now we're fighting like peppermint snails and floating eyeballs and the ugliest fucking tree stump I've ever seen in my life. God damn. There are also these bird guys called the flying men. These guys have always fascinated me because of how eager they are to sacrifice themselves. It's so weird. If we talk to one of them, they join our party while we're in Magicant and will help us fight against the enemies here. I try to avoid recruiting them though, because if they run out of HP during a battle, then they fucking die permanently and I feel really guilty about it. I don't like being responsible for such an earnest and compassionate character's death, good lord. If one of the flying men die, his gravestone gets erected outside of his house to remind you of the blood on your hands. And his brothers go, he died honorably. Anyway, my turn now. Just makes me sad. To the north of the peaceful town area, there are some guards protecting this castle. I'm guessing this is where Queen Mary lives? Now this is probably a pretty silly thing to bring up, but Ninten is like, what, 12? 
So he's probably learned about King Henry and the House of Tudors and shit in school. Do you think he was like mentally scrambling to try and figure out how to pretend to be Catholic here? Like, oh shit, my parents don't really do church at all. Hope Queen Mary doesn't burn me at the stake for being too Protestant. I don't know, Ninten probably wasn't worried about this at all. He's probably failing history. He's probably fucking failing every subject in school. <laughs> Never mind. Queen Mary's castle is crawling with these Texas Chainsaw Massacre looking guys. They're not malicious or anything, just kind of creepy to me. Queen Mary addresses us by name and says that we're welcome to hang out in Magican for as long as we want. We apparently ask her to sing for us, but she says that she can't remember her song. She really wants to sing, but needs us to collect all of the melodies so she can remember how the tune goes. Alright, now we've got a real reason to seek out all the melodies. How the fuck do we get out of Magican? Uh, if we explore around a bit, we find these wells. One of them actually leads towards this cavern that we can follow to reach the outside world. The way this area looks specifically really reminds me of how influential this game was on Kikiyama when they were creating Yumaniki. There are a lot of design similarities between the two games, and how labyrinthian they both can be, and from a visual standpoint and stuff. God damn, Yumaniki rules. I think if Kikiyama was the type of person that had any kind of public presence at all, they would probably say that this game is their favorite in the series as well. Just a hunch. There's a sleeping dragon down here but we can't wake him up yet, we're not powerful enough. There's this item down here as well that's easily the most useful item in the game called the Onyx Hook. If we pick it up and keep it with us, we can use it to teleport to Magic Hand at any time, but it's being guarded by this fish for some fucking reason. This is the only fish in the game, and for some reason it's guarding the Onyx Hook? I have no idea why there's a fish here. Sometimes this game just kind of throws shit at you to see how you react to it. I mean, the entire series does this, of course, but it's especially impressive to me here, I guess. This game daring to be quirky and strange back when video games barely had any standard tropes or design guidelines accepted by the public before they were like a mainstream thing. I don't know, it's just cool to me. After we beat the fish, we reach the end of the cavern and uh, I don't even have any commentary here. I'll just show you how bizarre this conversation is. Like, you see what I'm saying about this game just kind of throwing stuff at you? What the fuck was that guy on about? We never see him again for the rest of the game. Just this weird sad guy hanging out in this whatever magic ant is. Anyway, back in the regular world, things are starting to escalate just a bit. There's new enemies to fight, like flying saucers and these freaky looking robots that remind me of stick bugs. There's also more variations of violent animals and people, and we fight a shitload of them on our way to the next town, Marysville. Yeah, me too, buddy. Marysville is pretty similar to Podunk, but a bit bigger. The towns all kind of look similar to each other, but their layouts are all different. So if you're playing through the game yourself, I don't think it's disorienting or mundane or anything. Just seeing my footage out of context might make this game seem a bit samey to you, but whatever. It's not a big deal. It's definitely not a negative for me. Fucking every area in the original Legend of Zelda looks the exact same, and people still love to suck that game off until the cows come home. I'm allowed to give Mother a pass. I'm allowed. You can go online and literally do or say whatever you want. Fuck you. Marysville has a department store and a hotel and hospital and stuff just like Podunk, but good lord, look what happens if you talk to the doctor at the hospital in this town. Jesus Christ, am I playing a video game or am I in every healthcare facility in the fucking United States? There's a school in Marysville and it's kind of surreal to be able to just walk in and wander around unsupervised. I mean, some of the teachers ask us questions if we talk to them, but they don't really give a shit that some random person just entered their school and is wandering around. The 80s sure was a different time, huh? The door to the top floor of the school is locked, so if we walk around a bit, we find the school's custodian. He complains about his wife, and Nintendo's like, actually, she seems cool, because he's a woman respecting Giga Chad. And the janitor goes, yeah, you're right, my wife kicks ass, and he awkwardly walks us back up to the top of the school to unlock the door for us. Oh, wow. I actually really like this view a lot. It's, like, really nice looking. That mountain in the distance looks pretty familiar. Oh, shit, this trash can has Parkinson's, too. Ha <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> what? Okay, buddy, I won't tell anybody. Lloyd gets bullied and shoved into trash cans, I guess. Poor kid. He trusts us enough to come out of hiding, but he's really fixated on explosives and bottle rockets. That's probably his special interest. Respect. When I was his age, it was Sonic OCs. Not to get too personal here or anything, but I was shoved into trash cans and lockers and shit when I was in middle school, so I kind of feel a kinship with Lloyd. So let's go get him some bottle rockets from that factory he mentioned as a peace offering. Sweet's factory isn't really anything to write home about. It's the first factory in the game and it's really small with weak enemies to fight. It's a tiny blip in our adventure here. We get some bottle rockets and bring them back to Lloyd, and he immediately gets really excited and leads us down to the school laboratory. While he's leading us down there, he tells us about another factory where they're constructing a rocket that he's apparently excited about, and he tells us about how the kids at school call him names and stuff. I don't ever mean to wax poetic or anything, don't misunderstand me, but I really appreciate the simplicity of this game sometimes. Kids just kind of say things and do things for no reason, like bully a kid for being weird and quiet. When we arrive at the fucking school for the first time, some of the kids are either talking about how weird Lloyd is or how they're looking forward to beating him up later. And then on the flip side, how simple it is for Ninten and Lloyd to become friends. We just show interest in what he's all about, listen to him talk about his problems, and then we blow up a bottle rocket in the science lab together and we're friends for life now. Lloyd doesn't even say anything after we blow up the science lab, he's just our buddy now. He's our ride or die. I really like that, I don't know, it's quaint. Again, I'm not interested in trying to make myself seem like I'm smarter than I am or anything, or that I have some kind of unique or profound viewpoint because I played this fucking video game that came out in 1989 and liked it. I just find that its simplicity sometimes makes it more compelling and gratifying to me personally. Pee pee poo poo. Lloyd starts out at level 1, so he's significantly weaker than Ninten is when he joins up with us, but training him up to our level isn't so bad. The enemies we fight give a lot more experience points per fight than the enemies at the beginning of the game, and having Ninten handle most of the combat makes things go relatively smoothly. I don't mind grinding a bit to give Lloyd some time to catch up to us. Lloyd is a cool party member. He doesn't have any psychic abilities like Ninten, but he can use a lot of weapons and items in battle that Ninten doesn't know how to use like bombs and rockets and fucking guns. Again, he's a bit weak at first, but he's a powerhouse later on in his own way, and he's a welcome addition to the party. I like the way Mother handles fallen party members. If one of our guys runs out of HP in battle, we have to go to a hospital to go get them, and their ghost or spirit or whatever follows us around until we go save them. I think it's cute how they look like a little angel with the halo and stuff floating around behind us. It's really unique and charming. Kind of dark, but really charming nonetheless. We can also use the onyx hook to warp back to magic hand and we can revive fallen party members there for free. Man, what do you think Lloyd thought when we teleported to magic hand with him for the first time? See, look at him, he's at a loss for words. He's stunned. Oh yeah, that weird swimming cat was talking about a gift for a weakling child. I guess that's Lloyd. He gives him a magic candy that ups his stats a bit, which is nice. Did Aphex Twin name that song after Lloyd in this game? Probably not. I doubt he plays video games. I think he's probably too stuck up to do anything other than make music and jerk off. The onyx hook is super helpful for getting us out of a pinch, but it's a little cumbersome to walk all the way through the cavern to get back to the real world every time. I mean, it's fine. It takes like two minutes. Earlier Lloyd mentioned another factory with a big rocket. Let's go check that out. So I'll be honest, Duncan's factory is the roughest part of the game for me. It's absolutely massive, it's got lots of dead ends, and the enemies you fight here are just difficult enough to give you a bit of a hard time. Ninten has at least developed quite a few psi abilities that make the game a bit easier by this point though, like healing and removing negative status effects and stuff, so at the very least I was able to keep the boys alive while I was lost in this gigantic grey hellscape. The good news is that this is it, this is the worst, and it's really not that bad. While you're wandering around like a dumbass and crying and pissing your pants, the game graciously drops a bunch of items that permanently up your stats in here. So hitting a dead end isn't the worst thing in the world. At least you're rewarded in some way, and at least the game isn't fucking messing with your control scheme or some other stupid shit like that. It's extremely tolerable, sincerely. This is a good place to grind a bit as well. The enemies give you decent experience points for your time. The scientists in here all kind of look like Steve Buscemi. Lots of robots to fight. Lloyd, you said there was a cool rocket here. Where the hell is the cool rocket? Lloyd, if we can't find the cool fucking rocket, I'm gonna three-point shot you back into the garbage myself. Oh. Oh, shit. 
Lloyd, we're gonna get in fucking trouble for this. The rocket hits this huge boulder that was blocking the train tracks outside of the factory and thankfully doesn't go anywhere near Hawaii. Now for about two seconds after the launch, I was like, oh shit, guess I better find my way out of here now. But then I remembered we could either use the onyx hook to quickly get out of here or use some bread bread. In this game, bread can either be used as a healing item if you eat it, or you can use it to make a breadcrumb trail and instantly warp back to wherever you want. It's tight, actually. The game gives you a surprising amount of options a lot of the time. This is the most gracious RPG on the Famicom, probably by far. Honestly, I tried playing that first Fire Emblem game a while back, and it gave me lupus. So after Duncan's factory, we can follow the train tracks to see what's past that boulder we destroyed. Ah, oh, fuck. Lloyd, get behind me, it's Jesse Lacey from Brand New. There's a train station behind where that boulder was, and this guy inside of it is being a little dramatic. Just chill out, dude. I'll make you some chamomile tea. You can take a train ride to one of three cities. Oh boy. If we go to Reindeer and talk to this old lady at the station there, she asks if we're going to Snowman, and she gives us a hat that belongs to somebody named Anna. Reindeer is a fun area, but there isn't much to do here that's super important for our adventure. There's some places to explore and funny people to talk to, but the game is kind of nudging us to go to Snowman, so fuck it, let's go to Snowman. Let's go meet Anna. Oh hell yeah dude, Snowtown. I fucking adore snowy icy areas in games. I'm pretty sure I've said this in like every other video that I've made, but I don't care. It's still yes. true. I am in a short sleeve because snow. Yeah. This town is the best one as far as I'm concerned. Except for the fact that you can talk to people here and they can sneeze on you and get you sick. God fucking... Just go to the doctor and get treated for that real quick. Okay, back in Snowman and we're gonna avoid getting fucking tuberculosis from some contagious shithead this time. Oh shit guys, he's real. <laughs> now he's fucking dead! Anna is in this church with her dad, and she's like tripping out when she sees Ninten because she had a dream about him before. We give her her hat, and she tells us that she's been waiting for us to show up, and that we're supposed to help her find her mom. Aw, oh, man. Okay. Maybe this is just me being a sensitive dipshit, but I've always kind of been easily moved by stories about kids that lose their parents and are looking to find them. Fuga Melodies of Steel made me cry like a little bitch. Earlier in the train station, there was another girl with her father that was also looking for their lost mother. Wonder if these disappearing moms are connected somehow. Those guys said that they were heading out to Youngtown. Probably a good idea to keep that town in mind. We can take the train to Spookane, and when we head over there, it's immediately a little eerie. The town doesn't have any people in it. It seems totally deserted. There's a hotel, though. This guy looks kind of weird. Oh, wow, 18 bucks? That is by far the cheapest hotel in the game so far. Hell yeah, I'll stay here. You swindled me! Past the town, out in the fields, you can see all of the residents of Spookane hanging out over there because their homes and the city itself has just become too dangerous slash haunted. Sucks to be you guys, I guess. Okay, there's this kind of weird recurring bit in this game where women are just really charmed by Ninten. They think he's so handsome and shower him with compliments completely out of the blue. It's really funny to me because he just looks like fucking this. <laughs> Can't relate. Whenever pretty ladies see me in public, they spray me with insecticides. She gives us a key to this house out here that's apparently super haunted and tells us to go nuts. I'm getting Duncan's factory PTSD from looking at how big this mansion is from the outside, but it's not that bad. It's dark in here and there's lots of ghosts and stuff to fight, but it's built in a pretty linear fashion. Not too hard to reach the end. This extremely ordinary talking mouse at the beginning of the mansion mentions a room with a piano in it, so I guess we should keep an eye out for a piano. You know, in horror shit, it's always like, a piano? What do I need to do to get a haunted 808 drum machine in the next horror movie? Oh shit, it's a FromSoft character. We get to the end of the mansion and the piano plays the fourth melody for us. Been a minute since we got one of those, huh? I'd almost forgotten about them. Queen Mary's still sitting on her throne in Magic Hand, just patiently waiting for us to find all the melodies for her. But Ninten and Lloyd and Anna have just been running around like idiots, getting the shit beaten out of them by wild animals. I just got hit by a fucking car. Bug Error? Your son was named Bug Error? 
Can you legally change a kid's name when they're like old enough to have sentience and autonomy? What the fuck? Child Protective Services, how can I help you today? I'm calling on behalf of Bug Error Rosemary. I'm sorry? Sorry, his name is Ninten Rosemary. Um... There's not much more to do in Spookane or Snowman now, so we can head back to Union Station in Marysville. There's an area nearby that we haven't explored at all yet. This desert to the east of the station has super weird creatures running around. Some big bugs. Lots of cactuses. Cacti? I don't give a shit. This guy is offering paid plane rides and says that if we collect enough plane ticket stubs, he'll give us his fucking tank? What the fuck kind of drugs are you on out here, my guy? We're children. It's kind of funny, he says that there's a landmine out here in the desert too. Good god, that's stressful. I'm gonna try to not think about that while I'm wandering around out here. I actually read online that you can find the landmine and step on it and it explodes, and if you do, Shigesato Toy himself shows up and goes, Oh, you did it! <laughs> And he comes out of your TV and like bro fists you and kisses your mom on the lips, I don't know. The pilot takes us on a flight and circles around this specific cactus twice. It looks way different from every other cactus out here, so after the flight we check it out and find that we can communicate with it telepathically. Fifth melody. Look, I know it's a little obtuse. I know it's a little cryptic. But the plane guy circles it two times, and it sticks out like a sore thumb among the others here. Got a fucking penis coming out of its face. I still can't believe this guy is giving a tank to three little kids. This is gonna be so sick. We reach these ruins in the middle of the desert and get attacked by this big robot. Quite an adventure, huh? There's another weird Yumaniki-ass labyrinth down here with these monkeys that are all pathological liars. But this one's a breeze to get through because there's no random encounters in here. I'm grateful for the break, honestly. At the end of the tunnel, we find another funny pink telepathy rock that teleports us back to Magic Hand. And when we check out that dragon in the cavern, he actually responds to us this time. But he's a dickhead and he won't give us his melody until we beat the crap out of him. We have all three kids here pretty powered up with psi techniques and weapons and shit, and I even brought along one of the flying men to help us out here, but hilariously enough, I wanted to test out if one of Lloyd's super bombs would be effective on him because they destroy most enemies in a single hit, and uh, it worked. This was the easiest fucking fight in the game. I genuinely didn't expect it to work on a boss character like this, but uh, <laughs> thanks Lloyd. Okay, we're up to six melodies now, hell yeah. Since we entered Magicant through a new telepathy rock, when we exit the cavern, it spits us back out in the real world in a brand new area we've never been to before. It looks like there's some train tracks we can follow. Sure, I'm down to do some more stand by me shit with my new buds. I kinda skimmed over Anna earlier, so I'll just say now that she is by far the strongest party member we have, like offensively at least. Ninten only really learns Psy techniques that heal or support in some way, but Anna is scary powerful. She can use Psy to fucking freeze, burn, or electrocute enemies. Jesus. We follow the train tracks to a station that's out of commission and meet the most relatable video game NPC of all time. The other train station attendant guy needed a cup of chamomile tea, but I think this guy needs a Valium or something. Calm down. It seems like we've stumbled into Youngtown. If you remember earlier, that girl and her dad were coming here to look for her lost mom. They're not here though. Youngtown seems to have an ironically super fitting name now. Everyone here is a child and all of the adults are totally gone. There's kids crying, begging us to hold them, asking to bring back their parents. Fuck me dude, I can't stomach this shit. Who's gonna take care of all these goddamn babies? This little girl says that a big ship took her parents away. Other kids say that they saw the ship fly past the next town and up into the mountains. Now a link between the intro of the game and the game itself is beginning to take shape, but we'll hold off on diving into that for now until we have more pieces to put together. This game's story has kind of been loose and haphazard so far, with very few concrete things to guide us forward, like finding the melodies and meeting Lloyd and Anna has just kind of been what we've ended up doing without a clear sense of direction. This isn't a bad thing, mind you, and I actually really enjoy the fact that this game never really lets you 100% feel like you're heading in the correct direction, but it's interesting that things are starting to come together a little bit. If we explore around a bit more in Youngtown, we discover that there's a psychic baby living in this house. Talking to it obviously yields no notable results, but attempting a telepathic connection brings us to these incredible lines of dialogue. 
Have I complimented this game's sense of humor yet? I think it's seriously perfect. It's not a huge focus or anything. The jokes and silly moments are pretty infrequent, so I think they pack a bit of an extra punch when compared to later games in the series. All three games have a fantastic sense of humor, of course, but I'll say that I think I appreciate it most in this game. Earthbound has more jokes, and a lot of them are objectively funnier and shit, but the subtleties of Mother just hit different for me. The teleportation ability we get from the Goo Goo Gaga baby is fucking sick, too. If you've played Earthbound, you're familiar with it already, but it's a very useful side technique that obviously lets you warp to any town you've been to before. And I actually enjoy that you've got to make sure you have enough cleared out space to run in before you make that jump, it's a lot more fun than just immediately teleporting to wherever you want to go. It's like in Sonic CD, trying to get a running start before time traveling. I love when you accidentally hit something and it makes all three of our little guys here look funny when it explodes in their faces. It's cute. Those kids were talking about LA, the next town, let's try and make our way out there. I don't I don't think I've actually brought this up yet, but Nintendo has a map of the game's world. It's not super detailed or anything, but it was enough to help me get to wherever I wanted to go when I was playing. I didn't have to consult a guide that often, even though it's been years since I played this shit. Not that having to consult a guide regularly would have bothered me all that much, but for people that dislike having to utilize extraneous material, there you go. Gotta make our way through this big stinky swamp with these weird alien guys and crocodiles until we reach a house out here. Your dad's here. Damn, Lloyd. Can't even catch a break from your fucking dad. Why the fuck is Pippi out here? Did she buy this swamp house? Oh my god, I knew it. Her mom is an alcoholic. She came out here to escape. She graciously lets us heal up at her home and we're off. No fucking idea why Lloyd's dad is out here, but all right, man. He actually asks for your name, like the player's name, so the game can address you personally later in a bit of a primitive meta sort of way. It's not Metal Gear Solid 2 or One Shot or anything, but it's definitely somewhat novel for the time. I don't even remember where the game addresses you directly, so it obviously isn't a huge deal here. In Mother 2 and 3, they definitely did quite a bit more with this idea, having the in-game characters actually refer to you as a real person and stuff. Once we get past the swamp, we find ourselves in LA, the final city in the game. There's the typical setup here with the usual amenities and weirdo NPCs to talk to, as well as gang members that fight you in the streets. These guys are affiliated with the Blah Blah Gang, which is either the best name for a gang I've ever heard or the worst name for a gang I've ever heard. I'm not entirely sure. The citizens of LA are aware of the gang and their leader, who is apparently somebody named Teddy. Now from the intro of the game, we'd probably assume, oh cool, fourth party member is out here, but it is isn't exactly like that, you'll see. We find this live music club, definitely not a strip joint, being guarded by our wacky friend from the desert that gave us his tank. He's pissed off at us for breaking it, but like, didn't you give it to us, dude? Either way, he wants $200 for reparations, which is fucking nothing to us now. We have enough money to buy 10 copies of Earthbound on eBay. $200 is pocket change. We get into the club and this woman starts hitting on Ninten and buys him a drink. Then a cop comes in and for a split second I was like, oh man, this bitch is in trouble now. But no, we're the ones in trouble. Come on, pig, I'm the victim here. I'm being preyed upon and served alcohol. Shut down the club, arrest the woman, not me. Are you fucking kidding me? I'm a minor. Pig takes us back to the station and confiscates our weapons and refuses to let us leave until we admit that we did a bad thing. But I didn't fucking do anything, dude. Oh my god, they really want me to feel bad about this. I get it, it's a valid lesson to teach kids that alcohol is bad. I'm just not sure that this is the exact correct way to teach this lesson. Also, after the copious amount of grinding and wandering around we've done in this game, I think a drink would probably be a decent fucking idea. Speaking of lessons, Todd, this part also does a great job teaching kids that cops fucking suck. Mr. Jack in the corner over here will try to sell you your weapons back at a marked up price. But fuck that, I just went and bought new ones from the store in Magic Hand. Now that we're back Back in the club, I'm gonna avoid Julia Vickerman over here and see what else is going on. Oh man, uh, sure? Oh shit, it's Teddy. 
He attacks us immediately for beating up some of his gang buddies and he and Ninten trade attacks back and forth for a few turns. Now in the English localized release, it looks like we're having a fist fight here, but in the original Japanese version, dude is holding a knife. Jesus Christ. This is actually a decent place to talk about some of the censorship for the American release that took place in the localization process. I definitely understand a lot of these decisions. Removing cigarettes from the birds and bloodstains from the zombies and shit would obviously make the game a lot more family friendly, and although I wish the game was uncensored, it's not something I'm gonna shit my pants over. No vagina bones here for people to weep into their fists about. I think there are patched ROMs online that reintegrate these cut elements into an English version of the game, but I couldn't be bothered to find that for this video and I wanted to have a more authentic and relevant experience anyway, I guess. All of this is only kind of interesting and a matter of preference if you're planning on picking up the game yourself, but yeah. We beat the shit out of Teddy and he tells us that he admires our strength and that he wants vengeance for his dead parents. They apparently died in the same mountains that we're trying Trying to get to. You know, after a while, you start to question what a toy's relationship with his parents was like. I know that his folks divorced when he was really young and that he didn't really have a relationship with his dad, which kind of explains why the dads in this series are either faceless voices that just talk to you over the phone and deposit money in your bank account, or are portrayed as kind of shitty and flawed. It's interesting and just a small reminder that the games we play are made by people and shaped by their perspectives and experiences. It's cool. Video games are fucking cool. Teddy is a very interesting character. He's obviously quite different from our main three protagonists, as he's in his early 20s and a gang leader. He's also got a very narrow-minded goal here. I don't actually know what he plans on doing when he gets the Mount Toy, or who he intends to get revenge on. From what I can tell, his parents were killed by wild animals up here. This apparently drove him to drinking and getting into fights and bars and shit, and his gang started committing more crimes and general acts of malfeasance as a result, much heavier than anything Ninten, Lloyd, or Anna seem to have going on. Clicking through the wiki a little bit, it says that Teddy smokes a brand of cigarettes called horse shit, which I absolutely fucking love. Teddy can tell that Lloyd is our weakest link here, which I personally resent a little bit, but he's shockingly polite about this and just asks him to wait in the club while we go up to the mountain together. When this happened, I was immediately super bummed out because I really like Lloyd, and with Teddy replacing him in the party, we aren't going to be able to use any of his bombs or weapons. But I ended up rolling with it because Teddy is interesting and he's actually a really good party member. He's super strong and makes a lot of fights against random enemies a lot easier. Easier. So begrudgingly, we leave Lloyd behind. Yeah, keep that fucking lady away from him, alright? Mount Toy is the final notable area of the game. The enemies here are really strong, and the music has an uneasy kind of atmosphere. It definitely feels a lot less safe here than the rest of the game, which is saying something. Once we make our way through the caves and up the side of the mountain a bit, we find a house with an old doctor living in it. He heals us up, and Teddy says that he wants to make a few phone calls. Ninten and Anna hang out in this room to wait, and the scene that follows obviously shows its age but if you use your imagination a bit, I think it's actually an incredibly sweet scene. Just two kids, dancing together. The dancing matches up with the music that plays perfectly, and it's a little embarrassing to admit, but I found myself moved by these pixels moving around on my screen. My favorite quote on dancing is by one of my favorite documentarians, Adam Curtis. He was being interviewed by Chapo Trap House when he said this, and I'll just play the clip because I don't want to butcher what he says by paraphrasing or whatever. People behave as though they are being watched, even if they're not. Dancing is this really strange moment because on the one hand, it's that moment when many people give up that sense of self-consciousness and really let themselves be what they are. It's the moment when you are looking at people truly being themselves and it's wonderful and it's glorious. After this little number, Anna asks Ninten if he loves her, and they admit their feelings to each other. This shit is sincerely just really sweet to me. I don't have the heart to make any hilarious quips or jokes about this, I'm sorry. Teddy comes in and just fucking completely destroys the mood here. Thanks, asshole. And then suddenly we hear a bunch of loud crashing sounds. Oh fuck, it's another one of these guys, and this time we don't have a tank. It's way too powerful, no matter what we do, we can't win, it just wipes the floor with us. I have never been happier in my life to see you, Lloyd. After Lloyd saves us and takes us to a safe place, Ninten and Anna are revealed to be fine, but Teddy is a lot more seriously injured. I don't remember where I read this, but I remember reading someone interpreting this as Teddy shielding Anna and Ninten from the robot's attack, and I personally like this read a lot and will also assume that this is what happened. Teddy seems to have matured greatly in the few minutes we've had him around, but then Lloyd here drops my favorite line of dialogue in the game.
That's what's up. It looks like now we need to scale the mountain again, but it's admittedly a bit harder this time without Teddy's brute strength. Once we make it up there, however, we find that there's a huge lake near the peak. Lloyd fires up an abandoned boat and we ride it into this whirlpool, which sucks us down into this secret underwater laboratory. I like seeing the fish swim around in the window here. It's a really nice little detail, to be honest. I didn't mention this before when I was talking about Phil Sandhop and how he left the run button in the game, but essentially the run button just doubles the speed of every character on screen. So so it's funny to just stand around holding the run button. Just kind of makes it look like Ninten is making the fish move around really fast with his mind. Or the people too, I guess. We find this tall red robot in here named Eve. She boots up when we get close to her and explains that George, remember him from the intro, created her to protect us. What we can gather from what she explains to us, if it wasn't obvious already, was that one, George is our great grandfather. He's the one that wrote the diary that we use to get to Magicant and to learn Psy techniques. And two, he was abducted by aliens and then at some point dropped back off on Earth. The windows in the facility start to crack, presumably due to the sheer power of Eve being powered back on, and we end up back on the surface of the mountain. Eve is so powerful that she makes all of these ridiculously strong enemies that gave us hell coming up here seem like nothing at all. It's honestly like indescribably cathartic to breeze through all of these random encounters up here. I genuinely cannot express with words how satisfying it feels. Some people's ultimate power fantasy is committing thousands of counts of vehicular manslaughter or becoming the most charismatic womanizer on the planet, but mine is reviving a giant red robot lady and blowing up dozens of green spaghetti aliens. Different strokes and all that. Now what we're supposed to do here is climb to the top of the mountain, and Eve will lose a battle with another one of those big robots, and out of her corpse we get the seventh melody. But I fucked things up and somehow managed to die to a random encounter or something, and Eve ended up in remains at the bottom of this final part of the game. We get the seventh melody from her like we're supposed to, but now we have to travel throughout this entire section without the aid of a big powerful robot lady that one-shots every enemy. This ended up being fine, because Ninten has 4th Dimensional Slip, which is an ability that lets you immediately run away from a battle, but I get why everybody complains about Mounted Toy. They're over-exaggerating how hard it is, but it's no walk in the park, for sure. Look, I had objectively the worst possible time at Mounted Toy. I did things the wrong way, but I still won't bitch about it. Just run away from the battles, it's fine. Duncan's factory was way worse than this. At the top of the mountain, this is waiting for us. It's really satisfying to hear the full song that the eight melodies come together to make. The full song is very creatively named Eight Melodies, and if you remember earlier, it's actually the song from the really cool TV commercial for the game. This game's soundtrack was actually arranged as a full studio album, with Keiichi Suzuki, Hirokazu Tanaka, and Shigesato Itoi all like in charge of it, with performances commissioned from English singers and songwriters like Catherine Warwick. She did most of the vocals for the album, but I couldn't find much about her online. She didn't have much of a career after this, unfortunately other than the occasional single. The last thing I could find from her was that she contributed vocals to this dance song from 2005. Yeah, I hope so too, bud. No idea. The version of Eight Melodies that's present on the studio album, the version that was in the commercial, was performed by St. Paul's Cathedral Choir, which is a young men's choir in London and have apparently been active as far back as 1127, and to my knowledge, still actively release CDs and shit. Thought that was kind of cool. Now that we've completed the song, it's time to go back to Magicant to help Queen Mary remember it.
I find this scene of Queen Mary remembering her own identity as Maria, George's wife, to be really amazingly directed. She slowly remembers who she is while everything slowly gets darker and darker around us. She cries out the name of someone named Geeg and evaporates out of existence along with Magic Hand. Jesus Christ. We're back at the peak of Mount Tatoy, and this final cave has a side path with a room full of human beings held in stasis pods or something. It seems like this is where all of the disappearing adults from Youngtown are, along with Anna's mom and anyone else that mysteriously vanished recently. One guy in a pod tells us that there's no point in trying to rescue them until we deal with the mothership. Oh fuck, he did it! He said the thing! He said the name of the game, guys! Guys, do you get it? Do you get the- We enter the final room of the game, this unsettling dark cavern with a giant spaceship ascending in front of us. It's Geeg. This final battle has a sort of haunting atmosphere to it. Instead of one of the game's many awesome battle themes, we're stuck listening to this single high-pitched hum repeating over and over again. This scene really sticks out to me. We've been fighting a lot of unsettling creatures and robots and little UFOs and shit, but we're now face to face with an honest-to-god alien. It's kinda chilling. Geeg is unkillable. None of our attacks do anything to him at all. He talks with us in between hurling ridiculously strong attacks at us, telling us that he's grateful to our family, as George and Maria were the ones that raised him. Years ago, George stole vital information about psi techniques from his race. It would seem that George and Maria, whether they meant to or not, apparently made contact with the aliens 80 years ago, and they took them into their ship. Geeg's race experimented on them and observed them, gathering information on human beings, while George secretly was observing them at the same time. Maria took on the role of mother to Geeg, raising him and loving him like he was her own son. I assume that at some point, George either found a way to escape or was exiled from the ship. Although if that's true, I don't know why they wouldn't have just killed him. Maybe the aliens loved Maria and she influenced them to just letting him go free? I don't know. This is all speculation on my end and I'm sure there's thousands of threads on message boards and wikis online where people have studied this with supplementary material and shit, but basically, Geeg's race are planning on kidnapping a large selection of human beings and destroying the planet for whatever reason. Geeg offers Ninten and Ninten alone a chance to board the mothership and avoid extermination, but Ninten obviously refuses and Geeg continues to attack attack, telling us to just perish along with the other ugly earth people. The battle screen has a new option for all of us that we can click now called Sing. If we click it, we start to sing Maria's melody, but this really sets him off and he can't stand to hear it and screams at us to stop. He interrupts us numerous times by attacking us while we sing, but if we keep at it, alternating healing and singing between the three of us, eventually he's worn down completely. He tells us that he'll be back at some point and flies off in his ship. Uh, that's it. We're done. Anna gets reunited with her mom, we free the rest of the Earth people, Teddy fully recovers and has apparently found some kind of peace, the parents are reunited with their children in Youngtown, we drop Anna off at her home in Snowman, and Lloyd is regarded as a hero back at his school in Marysville. Ninten takes a nap, and that's the end. Overall, I find this to be kind of a melancholic ending, despite a lot of the characters reaching happy resolutions for themselves. Geeg is a very interesting character to me, and it's kind of heartbreaking to see how much unresolved conflict he has inside of him. regarding. Maria and his relationship with humans. This ending doesn't answer a lot of questions that people playing the game probably have, but I think that this game's minimal storytelling really pays off towards the end despite this. I know this game isn't as loved and revered by people that like the series, but I definitely implore anyone that likes Earthbound to give this game a shot. I know Earthbound uses a lot of similar ideas present in this game with arguably better execution, but I find this game's tone and atmosphere to be pretty unique, even now, and I would even say that I like it the most out of the three games in the series. If Earthbound and Mother 3 are comparable to an album like In Rainbows, I would say that Mother is like Kid A. It's a lot less upbeat, it's a bit less accessible, and maybe it won't do anything for you at first, but there's beauty to behold here that the right people will appreciate and cherish. This is a really bad analogy, but fuck it, I'm tired and I've been listening to a lot of Radiohead lately, so this is the analogy that you're getting. The way I see it, Mother is an even more influential game than Earthbound is. People that worked on this game would go on to develop Pokemon Red and Blue versions, and a lot of themes and ideas that were conjured up during the development of Mother
father bled into Pokemon. And obviously, without this game, Earthbound wouldn't exist. At least not in the form that it does now. This is extremely hyperbolic, but in a way, Mother is really the most important game ever made. It's truly and honestly a trailblazer in every sense of the word, and so much of what I appreciate about video games wouldn't exist without it. If this video convinces even one person to go back and give Mother an honest try, then I'll be content in knowing that. I covered a lot of what happens in this game, but there's still quite a bit of stuff that I didn't touch on, and playing the game yourself, you might find that you do things in a different order, or that you discover things that are pretty cool that I didn't bring up at all, or you may even come to your own conclusions and interpretations of the story or characters or whatever. Maybe Nintendo really is Ness's dad, I don't fucking know. I definitely, definitely recommend giving it an honest shot. If you have a Nintendo Switch and pay for the Soy subscription or whatever, then you already have this game in your NES Classics library. Boot it up and give it a try, I really think it's worth your time and effort. Shigesato Atoy obviously ended up directing Earthbound after this, and then years later contributed to Mother 3, which I will say is another beautiful fucking game that everyone should play. After that, he pretty much retired from game development, and has stated that he has no intention of continuing the series himself. He said that if Mother 4 ever happened, he would like it to be made by fans of the series. And in a way, that sort of happened already. Games like Hylix and Yuminiki and Lisa share that same magical quality to them, I think. As well as that game Oddity, which very transparently started out as a Mother fan game, but is now something completely original. If that game is still being worked on, I'm not 100% sure. I can't find much information online about the game's creators or if it's still being worked on or not. I hope it's still being worked on, but I can't be sure. I don't know how to end the video. You should play Mother if it looks interesting to you at all. I think it's a really special game, and if you can get past some of its archaic design choices and some of its mild tedium, it's a great experience. All three of these fucking games are fantastic in their own distinct ways, and they're all worth your time and attention, but I think I'm content saying that the first is my favorite. I'm going to bed, thanks for watching.